Today we'll be working through a series of steps common to many projects in ancient studies. So given a text, some number of objects, or some research data, there's usually a geographic aspect, and often there's a desire to analyze or visualize that geography programmatically. So the question arises, how do we get structured data for these geographic tasks. How do we move from a text or a list of places related to some objects or survey information and map it or do geographic analysis? We'll be taking as an example a really interesting set of objects called the Vicarello Cups. The name is a modern one. We don't know what these things were called in antiquity. Uh, the, this modern name takes the Italian place name associated with the site of discovery, which is uh, just north of the ancient Sabatinus Lacus in Italy, so you're uh, to the north and west of Rome. In antiquity, this site uh, on the north was called Aquae Apollinares Novae. It was a health spa and bathing establishment sacred to the god Apollo, fed by natural hot springs. These springs remained popular even after the fall of the Roman Empire, and in the mid-19th century, a series of renovations and repairs were conducted, and during that work, a large series of votive deposits were found in the spring themselves. This uh, series of deposits included coins and other objects, many of them made of precious metals. Among these are the objects shown here. There are silver cups, four of them, inscribed with itineraries, and they're now in the Museo Nazionale in Rome. Itineraries are textual descriptions of journeys, usually land journeys, uh, indicating major waypoints and the distances between them. Now, in the case of all four of these cups from uh, Aquae Apollinaris Novae, the itinerary in question is a land itinerary, and it's from Gades, modern Cadiz in Spain, so on the southwest coast of Spain, all the way to Rome. We're going to try to take the text that appears on one of these cups and move it into a structured data environment so that we can map it and could potentially perform some kind of analysis on it, say looking at the distance figures or something else. Along the way, we'll introduce a number of tools and make reference to some other information that I've uh, provided here. We'll get our text from the Electronic Archive of Greek and Latin Epigraphy, and specifically from the Epigraphic Database Roma, which provides information about Roman inscriptions from ancient Italy. We'll make use of two software tools, one called OpenRefine and the other called GeoCollider. These two tools will allow us to take the data we've created and to collate or align it with the Pleiades Gazetteer, which is an online resource for information about ancient places and place names. That process has been described in a blog post that I recently wrote on my blog, Horothesia, and I've provided a reference to that here for future use. So the first step in many projects is, as we've indicated, assembling a miniature gazetteer for the project. Ideally, this is a collection of structured data about the place names and places that are relevant to whatever the research question is. For our example today, working with the Vicarella Cups, uh, what we will do is we will try to make structured data for each of the places that are mentioned on the cups, and we can use that then for visualization or analysis. Fortunately, the text of the Vicarello cups has already been published, so uh, we're in a position to copy that text for our own research purposes and then work it into structured data. The structured data that we're going to try to produce is in the comma separated values format, so a simple table, something you could open in a spreadsheet program or in a wide variety of other software. 
we're going to work through the process of collecting the text, making it into a minimally sufficient CSV file, and then adding some information to the CSV file that will set us up for the next step, which is trying to align it or reconcile it with a digital gazetteer that can provide us with coordinates so we can do some visualization. The Eagle Inscriptions project uh, provides access to and search of a number of different online sources of epigraphic material, and that's what we're going to use to find a text of the Vicarello Cups. We'll go to their search page, and the easiest way to do this is some to search for some distinctive text that's in the inscription. I happen to know that several of them include the word itinerary in Latin, itinerarium. So we'll search for that. And we get five results. So we're going to scroll down and see uh, this doesn't seem to be related. Inscription from Forum Clodii, da 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 da, Abgades usque Romam itinerarium. Okay, so from Gades. Uh, to Rome, an itinerary. This is one of them, the one I'd like to use for our purposes here because it requires the least amount of editorial intervention is this one. So we're going to click on that result, which takes us to the Eagle display. And what we really want to do is get to the original source. So we're going to go to the website of the epigraphic database Roma, which provides that particular text. And in fact, here we have the text. It's got a unique identifying number, but what we're interested in is the text itself. So we will just select that text from beginning to end, and we will copy it. We're now going to switch over to a text editor. Any good text editor should be able to support doing this. I'm using Sublime Text on a Macintosh, but uh, there are lots of other choices, both open source and paid, and we'll paste in the text. Now, what we have here is some plain text that's got some uh, aspects to it that make it a little difficult to use as uh, ordered data, structured data, uh, on its own. The uh, interstitial periodic introduction of line numbers is useful, problematic, and then also the column indications. But we can fix all that with a little judicious use of regular expressions. Regular expressions uh, uh, is a language for manipulating, matching, and manipulating text. This particular text editor supports the execution of regular expressions on textual content, and that's what we're going to use. And our goal is to produce a comma-separated values file. We want two columns. The first column will contain line numbers, one for each line, and then the second column will contain the text as we have it. And then we can uh, uh, get rid of these column entries later. So I'm going to invoke the appropriate section of this. And the first thing I want to do, I think, is to match any line at the very beginning that has uh, one or more digits beginning that line. So that's going to capture our line numbers. And these can have some space after them. And then I'm going to produce a new line that repeats the number we've matched, introduces a comma and a space, and then the rest of the line that wasn't matched will be copied in. So here I have now intervened in those lines, like this first one, and we've got a comma, which is the delimiter we use in comma-separated values. Now I need to introduce a comma at the beginning of each line that does not have a um, number in it so that we can avoid having these things be in the wrong columns. So here I've made an expression that matches any column that begins with something other than a number. And you can see it's picking up those initials, but not the initial of that line. And here, since we don't have a line number indicated, we're just going to put in a comma, which will cause a blank cell to appear in that column. And then we'll reintroduce the rest of the line. There we go. 
we are now ready to uh, treat this information as comma separated values. So we're going to save it into a convenient directory. I think we should give it a name that will help us remember where we got it from. In this case, the EDR number. And we are going to give it the CSV extension. So we remember that it's comma separated values. We can now dispense with our text editor. And what we're going to do now is open up this file in LibreOffice, which is an open source Office application and one that understands how to read CSV into a spreadsheet. That will give us a spreadsheet view that we can use to make more changes. Here we go. It's correctly identified the structure of the file. And we will bring it onto our screen. And here we have the data. First thing we want is a header. We're going to introduce the two columns, line and text. And then we're going to add a third column, place name. So this will be the place name drawn from the text on that line that we want to do something with in terms of our research. We're also going to take these column headers and turn them into another cell of data at the beginning of each line so that they're not in the way and they're not getting confused with text. And so when we work with our data later, we always know uh, for a given entry which column and which line the item came from. And now to make things easier to read. There we go. We're going to save this as a separate file so we don't write over what we're doing. And we're going to change the name appropriately. Um, LibreOffice likes to warn us that uh, there are kinds of things in spreadsheets that won't save into CSV, but we're okay with that. We know what we're doing, so we're going to proceed. <clears throat> First thing we need to do is get columns. There is a useful function in most spreadsheet tools called fill. that will repeat a number in the first cell into all other selected cells. This quickly lets us associate the column number we note there's a keystroke for doing it more quickly Now we have a column number for each line, so we can get rid of the lines that were functioning as headers. Now we want to get line numbers everywhere they belong. We'd like to fill with a series, and um, most major spreadsheets have an easy way for doing this. You start with your initial number, and then you click and drag the little handle on the selected cell, and that fills a um, series into the cells. Now, for each and every line, we have a good reference to what column number and what line number in the original text that line came from. The next thing we need to be able to do to work with this information as structured data in a spatial context is to extract the place names from the data. And this is where uh, we need to pay a little more attention to the text itself. We'll notice that the majority of lines 
consist of a place name and then a number using Roman numerals. These place names are interpreted to be the major stops along the itinerary and then the distances associated with them. You'll note that the units are not indicated. There are a couple of other lines. This first one, Itinerarium Agades Romam, and the last one, Summa Milia Passus, uh, which are not just place name number. Itinerarium Agades Romam is a heading or an introduction or a title. Um, so it's not properly one of these lines. And then the final line is a summation of the numbers of um, uh, Roman miles. And here we're actually given the units, Milia Passus, uh, that the whole itinerary requires. One of the characteristics of the names in the um, major lines of this inscription is that they tend to be in the accusative case. This is one of the challenges of dealing with an inflected language and place names in an inflected language, which is that uh, you will often have to normalize or make those names nominative. You can run into other problems trying to identify place names as well, but that's the first one we have to concern ourselves with here. In the first line, Gades is not a problem because of the way it declines. In the second line, we have a prepositional phrase with the preposition odd that functions as a place name, and odd takes the um, accusative, so we're not going to concern ourselves with that. But here we have hastam, which is an accusative of hasta, ugia, or ripus probably, hispalis, carmo, and so on. And we could work our way all the way down this list, sorting out what the probable nominatives are. Uh, but we're not going to do all of that in the interest of time today. So we will save this CSV file, and then we'll move on to the next phase in the process, which is using the Open Refine tool to align or collate our data set against the Pleiades Gazetteer. Let's collate our Vicarello data set against the Pleiades Gazetteer of Ancient Places. To do this, we'll need two tools. The first one is called OpenRefine, which is a tool for working with tabular data and cleaning it up and enhancing it. And another tool called GeoCollider. GeoCollider is a web service written by Ryan Bauman at Duke University, and it's designed to work with OpenRefine. What it does is it takes some of the Pleiades uh, data set and makes it uh, available for queries designed to match up place names with the identifiers that Pleiades uses for the individual places. OpenRefine runs uh, as a local server. Once you've installed it, uh, you, you fire it up as you would any other application. And once it's up and running, it's going to open a window on your computer. In the prefatory material for today's talk, I included a link to a blog post I recently put up about how to do OpenRefine with Pleiades, and it provides information on download and installation and so on, so I thought I'd alert you to it here. We're also going to use some of the code snippets that are in it for our demonstration today. The first thing to do in OpenRefine is to open the file we've created. The standard process that should be getting familiar where you're shown a preview, you're asked to verify character encoding, give your project a name, all that sort of thing you've seen in various kinds of programs that deal with CSV and other data formats. Here's our data chunked into nicely helpful amounts. What we're going to do is we're going to ask OpenRefine to work with GeoCollider to uh, look at these place names and try to find possible matches in Pleiades and then present them to us so we can do things like get the latitude and longitude for those matching places. The term of art used by OpenRefine is reconciliation. So we go to the reconcile submenu on the place name column and we start reconciling. We're asked to use the Pleiades reconciliation, which is uh, uses GeoCollider. This is something you'll have to set up the first time. It's very easy. The blog post shows you how.
Once the service is up and running, we leave all the defaults as they are and we say start reconciling. Depending on various settings, this may take uh, anywhere from a couple of seconds to a couple of minutes, but the result will be that we're presented with various options for each of the places. So here we have uh, only one match for Gades. That's uh, Gades itself. That one's not problematic. We can just say, yes, that's the one we're talking about. I've reconciled and matched that particular one. Ad Portum might present a little bit more of a problem, except that one of the alternate names for the port of uh, ancient Gades uh, includes the name Gades. So it's really quite obvious if we're beginning a trip from Gades that we might go through uh, the port. But then we come to Hosta. Which Hosta is meant? Well, the only way we can be sure is to have a human go look at Pleiades, and that's easily done by uh, transiting the link provided by OpenRefine and GeoCollider. I'm going to open these in a new tab so I don't lose track of where I am. Here's a Hosta that's in northern Italy. I don't think that's our target. Here's one that's in coastal northern Italy. I don't think that's our target. Ah, but here's one near the Bay of Cadiz. This is probably our target. We're going to go ahead and uh, assume that it is and click the corresponding checkbox, which matches it up. The other examples uh, that uh, where we have matches here are not problematic. Uh, if we were being disciplined, we would check them all uh, to make sure that we agree with the choice we've been, we've been given because things can go wrong. We can be a little surprised by Oripus uh, that we haven't gotten a match. I'd have thought that would be in Pleiades. Maybe we need to go look for ourselves. Maybe something's gone wrong in the GeoCollider process. Or with our data. Ah, it, Pleiades knows about a place near the Bay of Cadiz that uh, is called Oripo. Could that be our target? Quite possibly. Maybe we've uh, stumbled on a source that uses a different declined version of the name. Maybe we've mistakenly supplied the wrong nominative since we were in a hurry doing that part of the work, uh, maybe there's some mistake in transmission of text. These are all concerns that can arise. Uh, in any case, we could go back and modify our data set, run reconciliation again, and get a better result. Um, or we could just uh, uh, add that information to the data set directly in OpenRefine. Another point uh, worth raising right now is that OpenRefine doesn't have to be the only tool you use for this. Some gazetteers don't support OpenRefine. Um, you may have a situation where you have a, a few enough items that you can go to the gazetteer you're trying to match and look them up by hand and copy and paste. There's lots of ways to do this particular reconciliation task. The important thing to remember is that there almost always needs to be some human supervision of the project and the process, some checking of the results, and uh, probably an iterative approach as you learn more about your data and about the gazetteer you're aligning to. We'll move on uh, at this point and uh, go ahead and try to get the latitude and longitude for the places we've already matched. What we want to do is get a link not to the individual Pleiades entries for particular places, but to a structured data version of them in the JavaScript object notation or JSON language. This uh, bit of information we're after is specifically the so-called representative point, which is calculated by Pleiades based on the detailed location information that's there. And it's simply a named object in the JSON that is a list of two elements, the longitude and then the latitude. You need to make note of the order in which they appear. This is in accordance with a particular standard that places the longitude before the latitude. Pleiades puts the JSON information at a link that is simply the Pleiades ID or the Pleiades Uniform Resource Identifier with the uh, postfix JSON. You can always get it that way. So we'll tell OpenRefine that we want to create a new column based on this column. We'll call it the JSON URI. 
And what we want to do is use the reconciliation match. And to remember the syntax, it's the ID. And then we want to add that little string slash JSON. So here's an example of what we're going to get. Boom, there we have our JSON URIs. It's at this point that we could add Oripus if we wanted to, but we're not going to take the time. Instead, we want to actually direct open refine to visit each of those JSON pages on Pleiades and pull that information down here so we can do things with it. This is done with edit column, add column by fetching URLs. We're going to create a new column and we're going to fetch these URLs directly into the column. The easiest way to find Google Fusion tables online is to use the Google search engine to look for the help page, and then there's a convenient link there. It's a little bit less obvious than some other Google services because it's a so-called labs or beta uh, a piece of software, and so is not um, always obvious how to get to. Here's that help page, and I want to go straight to creating a fusion table. It's pretty simple. You upload your table, and then you look for a map. How does this work? Well, you choose the file. Uh, here is our file. Google has figured out its comma-separated value. It's detected that the character encoding is UTF-8, so we're going to move ahead. It's having a quick look at the data uh, and showing that to you. And it looks like it's properly parsing the commas and so on. And finally, it's going to ask us for a name. They want to know if we will let other people export the data and so on. And uh, we're going to just move past that step to look at our data. One of the reasons I wanted to use Google Fusion tables to take a first look at visualization of this data was because it's designed to give you a map if there's a latitude and a longitude column in the data set. It's just built in. So all I have to do is have a latitude and longitude column. I've loaded this data in. I click on the map of latitude tab, and I'm presented with a map. It's got modern topography and place names and so on in it, but it also has my data right here. Here's the beginnings of our itinerary headed toward Rome. The map is set up so that it will display a little pop-up with the rest of the content of your data. The fact that uh, the JSON is in there makes it a little messy. Uh, we can always change the info window to leave out the JSON, so that's a little bit less uh, distracting. And when we're done with it, we can uh, browse the map, we can show it to colleagues, we can decide if we're really getting uh, the basic geography right. And then we can go on to other tools to produce other kinds of visualizations, to do more analysis of our data, now that we've had this first kind of visual confirmation that it's in good shape. That's a very quick look at a basic workflow for getting some data related to a particular text or a particular set of research questions into a structured format that can be mapped quickly. We've alighted a number of concerns about data quality, about accuracy of coordinates, about precision of coordinates, and so on. But the basic workflow should be clear, and other tools can be used as appropriate.